Some critics scoff at how unsubtly the ending hammers home its message. I suppose that comes mainly from people who see this as a film by Robert Wise. A finish so brutal and blunt might seem like a misstep for a filmmaker of Wise's finesse and taste. But would such criticism be leveled at a film by Harry Belafonte, which truthfully is just as apt? And having read the original script, I could even suggest that this is a film by Abraham Polanski, since virtually everything we see on screen is spelled out precisely in his screenplay. Odds Against Tomorrow is a prime example of why I don't put a lot of stock in the auteur theory or the a film by credit. This movie belongs equally to its chief collaborators, Polanski, Belafonte, and Wise, or else it belongs to none of them. There were, of course, other essential collaborators. Director of photography Joseph Brunn was chosen specifically because he worked almost exclusively in New York, where the picture was shot. Wise told him, I want an atmosphere of increasing menace and a climax of catastrophe. We will ignore the rules and regulations of conventional visualization. Brunn considered Wise a genius, commenting that the man breathes, lives, and thinks in film terms. His heart beats at film speed. There's greatness in his simplicity and deep knowledge in his modesty. In brief, it's sheer enjoyment and inspiration for the director of photography. Wise had begun as a film editor, notably cutting Citizen Kane, and he had an editing plan in place for every scene. Yet he encouraged the assigned editor, a woman working on only her third feature, to experiment with her own ideas. Some of the film's smash cuts, completely fresh at the time, were the work of young Dee Dee Allen, who would become one of the most influential and respected editors of all time, with pictures to her credit like The Hustler, Bonnie and Clyde, Dog Day Afternoon, and Reds. Harry Belafonte once offered this insight about the film. Earl Slater is more than just a racist. He's a working class guy in America who gets trapped by the system and who does not know how to work his way out of that system. So he has bought the story that it's race causing him to fail. He doesn't have a job, he's looking for a way out, and he's in exactly the same stuff that Johnny Ingram's in. Now let's remind ourselves, this is 1959 he's talking about. Robert Ryan initially turned down the role he didn't want to play another bigot, a character he'd embodied in Crossfire, Clash by Night, and Bad Day at Black Rock. But the actor felt Polanski's script said something significant without preaching. Ryan saw his character as not strictly a Negro hater, but as a man who hates the entire human race. He singles out Johnny for abuse because in Ryan's words, this young black man is better looking, better dressed, and more intelligent he is, in fact, everything Slater would like to be, but isn't. It's nice to note that Harry Belafonte and Robert Ryan remained best friends. As a lifelong activist for social change, Belafonte recognized Ryan as a kindred spirit. Although he specialized in portraying unrepentant racists, in real life, Ryan was one of Hollywood's highest profile liberals, progressive enough that the John Birch Society was compelled to burn crosses on his front lawn. Belafonte said of his co-star, there was not a sweeter, dearer, more humane or compassionate human being than Robert Ryan. The same could be said of Robert Wise. Knowing that Gloria Graham was suffering in her personal and professional life, Wise had Abe Polanski write a character into the script for her. The role of Helen Svensson isn't essential to the plot, but it gives the actress a memorably sinister and sexy reunion with her Crossfire co-star. The scene validates Graham's status as one of Noir's most potent and provocative dames. And let's not overlook Ed Begley as the caper's mastermind. His early screen roles coincided with the rise of Noir, Sorry Wrong Number, The Street With No Name, On Dangerous Ground, and many others. Although he's probably best known as Juror 10 in 12 Angry Men, the picture he made just before this one. Dave Burke's demise is something the filmmakers couldn't have gotten away with a few years earlier. The production code prohibited suicide as a way of escaping justice. But the code was wobbling by 1959 as evinced by many bits of business in this film, including Coco, played by Richard Bright, one of the most obviously gay characters in any movie of the era. 
And lastly, keen viewers probably noticed two future stars. The soldier who calls out Slater in the bar was the first screen role for Wayne Rogers, who'd become famous 13 years later as Trapper John in the TV series MASH. And the bartender witnessing Belafonte's breakdown is none other than Cicely Tyson, just beginning an illustrious career that would lead to her hand and footprints enshrined on the Hollywood Walk of Fame at the 2018 TCM Film Festival. Tyson passed away last month at the age of 96. Well, next week, it's Killer's Kiss, made by Stanley Kubrick at the start of his career, years before he became one of the most important filmmakers of the 20th century. In the meantime, check in on Noir Alley's Facebook page and Twitter feed, and let us know what you thought of Odds Against Tomorrow. I hope it's getting its due as a great film, just one of many contributions Harry Belafonte has made to American popular culture. Until next week, steer clear of the junkies and the joy boys. Thank you.